2008, um, and that basically led to how VMware is dealing with compliance. So if you go to like VMware's white paper, I started with payment card industry compliance. As part of that, that white paper got some good notoriety, uh, and he said, well, can you come and present at VMworld? So in 2010, I ended up presenting at VMworld. Uh, and if you guys have never been there, VMworld has about 20,000 people that show up. So my presentation I gave, I gave here and in Copenhagen, I ended up presenting this paper to about 2,000 people. Uh, as part of that, um, other folks heard about this, HP, IBM, maybe you've heard about some of these guys. Uh, these guys saw that we were doing and said, hey, we got the same challenge as VMware. We want to work on this paper too. So that now led to other things that, that, are, uh, that are going on that's leading me. I'm doing a uh, presentation now at, at RSA. I'm dealing with the Cloud Security Alliance. This led to the uh, intelligence community uh, thing. So all these things tracked because basically, you know, I didn't know how this stuff would work out, but basically eight years ago, I volunteered my time to help out with a benchmark, work within the community, and started understanding some of the fundamentals. And those guys, I mean, this, if you look at that list, those guys are the influencers now, eight years later. Um, and it's amazing in the, in the security world, there's, it's a pretty, it's a, I don't think it's a tight-knit group, but there's a small number of people that kind of know each other and are really influenced. And if you look at it, you tie those up, it's amazing how many people are tied back to companies like CatSafe or Leviathan or some of those things. And that's what's going to be I feel like, I look around the whole fire and I say, that's what's going to happen. I think five or 10 years from now, people are going to look at the people we have and say, wow, I can't believe all those people were together in one place or, you know, you were creating something that was unique. So that's something I guess I would say is if you're looking to start and you want to get on, you know, join one of these things, contribute, give back your knowledge. Other people want to share their knowledge with you and it will, it will it's just going to be a great accelerator. Um, I've heard a lot about uh, Node.js lately. Um, I was wondering if you guys were familiar with that or use it, because it seems like we're in the last four years or so. It's an event driven uh, JavaScript server. Are you dealing with it that much? Because I guess uh, Azure is using it, Microsoft is off of it, and we've been using it. So I think guys are taking it too. Yeah, so you're talking in an area, so this is a good, the other good part of our consulting is to say when you don't know something. So I don't know that, but I can tell you I think what's up to that I'm finding, that you guys might find. And, and so what I'm doing is, you know, I never knew that virtualization was going to lead to kind of the cloud computing and all that stuff later, but here's what, here's what I do think is happening, and you guys can feel free to disagree with me. Uh, right now, as people are moving to, to cloud computing and, and things like that, what we're doing is we're taking physical infrastructure and we're virtualizing that right now. Um, so we're taking networking gear and virtualizing it to like a Cisco switch <coughs> is becoming a Nexus 1000B, which has virtualization technology. You're taking physical servers and, and translating them and the applications that we're developing are still being developed with the, the mindset that they're running on code that's on operating systems um, that are built to do this stuff. What we're finding is, why, why deal with that, right? Right now, you basically, you've got an infrastructure that you're, you're dealing with right here. Um, you know, in cloud computing, all infrastructure as a service. Um, then they've got platform as a service, this is like your IIS server or, or Apache or something like that. And then what you're doing is you're dealing with the application like Right? And, and what people are doing, I mean, we saw this back in the, because I still dealt with the Navy, right? People developed an application with a certain OS in mind. But I can't tell you how many people can't upgrade from Windows NT because they're using this little application that requires you to run as a local administrator and only runs on Windows NT, right? So they designed those, and I think those were some, those are some of the issues that we found in the Navy and in some of the classified areas is, it's great when you adopt new technology, if you don't think about how things are going to evolve, you end up getting stuck. So the, the things that are happening right now is you're developing these applications but as we're developing these, there's a virtual machine, and if you think about this, if you take your Windows machine and you virtualize it, it is just a, a file, of, it's a software file. It's called the OBF, an open vir, uh, virtualization format, where you're taking something that's just, all it is is software. We're creating a lot of these things and just creating it through a software base. And if you have that and you say, well, the platform really is just a bunch of software. If, the, if you can take a Windows 2008 server and do all that stuff, it's just software. Why would you just develop applications that are agnostic from the platform and just directly interact here? In the future, why don't we create applications and code that it doesn't uh, rely on what platform they're running? You can run it across different clouds. That's something that's happening right now. When you look at like uh, when you see some of the Google servers and you see some of those things right there, that's the advances that people are making right now. So that's kind of the unique thing <coughs> you guys can think about within applications is. 
you can continue doing, you know, going after SQL, going after some of those things. But at the end of the day, is there a way that would be more efficient that we can do that now that the kind of takes on? How will that change uh, where you guys are going? Um, how, what are those things? And then, you know, within that niche, look for different communities that are looking for different tool sets and, and, and things that you're doing, and you can start tracking those to see if they're getting traction. And that can then allow you to get a good niche. And when someone like Microsoft says, we need someone that has experience doing something this way or something, you get that, that little niche because you've been supporting that stuff. So I think this is going to be kind of a unique uh, a, a unique thing. And the other part, really, from the application side is really that, that transition to mobile. So <coughs> mobile applications, the other areas, once you, you know, you've taken all this stuff, you put it in the cloud, what is the difference between a desktop, uh, an iPad, and an iPhone? If it's just using a browser, again, if it's using a browser, and that browser doesn't care about the underlying operating system, who really cares? So how is that going to change our technology in the future, right? If you may create, you may create something, and it's got to run on a refrigerator just as much as it's got to run on, on, a, uh, on a desktop, right? Those are the things that are happening right now that are, that are going on. I can tell you, right now, we've got this deal. Think about this. We've got the penetration group loves this. We're dealing with a major automotive company, you know, one of the, the big four that kind of came to us because they said, hey, we're still deploying all this new technology in our cars. Our cars are going to be IP enabled. They're going to have interface. What are the risks? So before we hadn't worried about these things, but now you've seen it. OnStar has been hacked, and people are turning off cars, right? You're breaking the police cars remotely. So as all that stuff's happening, all of a sudden the value from application developers and what they're doing uh, is a big deal. You find that there's right now a lot of people who are probably interested in you. You guys want to create something, right? You wanted to develop applications that do something and make the world better. Um, what happens is a lot of those applications, though, and I'm not sure how much. Like, do you guys get any security training in what you guys are doing, or much? Do you guys know about OWASP top ten or any of that stuff? So what happens if you develop an awesome application, and it turns out the whole world starts using it, and then it gets hacked? That's happened, you know, with Facebook not too long ago, where they the, an application flaw that they had uh, basically allowed someone to circumvent some stuff. So for me, is if you really want to be passionate about something, you want it to work, you have to ensure that it works correctly. And now, you know, that's, that's a big thing that's happening. Now. Like people have a lot of great ideas, but if you can't demonstrate that it's going to work correctly, or you haven't thought about the functionality, like logging and monitoring, don't do logging and monitoring just for the sake of troubleshooting. What happens if there isn't? Is are you logging the thing that's going to allow someone to kind of uh, take things through? Because now all the forensics that we used to do, again, we used to go and take a, take a computer and take <coughs> an image of it, you can't do that in, in Azure. Right? You can't go to Microsoft and take images of terabytes and terabytes of data and say, what you're doing is you're actually following application logic now to figure out what happened and how people run or we move So there's some, I mean, some really unique things. And really, when I kind of look at my skill set and all the things that I have, this is the one here. You know, application security is probably the one that I'm definitely weakest in. I mean, I've done some coding and I've done, I've done some things. But it, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy sitting in front of a monitor just typing away and code. I like making things work, which is why I hate it. They start developing a, developing something, I will just work all night long until I make it work. So that's kind of the bad part. But it's interesting. So when you think about that, and this, this is the thing, is I, I think you guys are fine. If you guys want to compete in the application space, um, the newer newer things out there for security is going to continue to be a, a hot thing, and then mobile devices are going to continue to be something that's hot. So if you guys can look at that, and you know, I would suggest that you guys focus on mobile technology and uh, integrating some of the, the fundamentals of security, and you get you know, the, there's going to be a huge thing. I you guys know, but about some of the estimates for about 50% of the IT jobs that exist today won't exist in about two years. Um, and, and part of that is because as this goes away, <coughs> our company used to need five people to manage exchange. Outsourcing to the cloud now, you don't need those five people. What do you need? You need people that can help your business run. What are those guys going to do? They're going to customize applications. They're going to customize things for you, right? So even though there's 50% less jobs, the skill sets are, are, are different. You guys are one of the, the two skill sets that I see kind of IT evolving around are application security and virtualization technologies. So you guys are, I think, are 50% past the, the field that's growing. Did you have a question? Or you yeah, question? I do. Like, kind of more of a non, non general, non technical question, kind of directed Rick. Uh, kind of looking at your path to success and you know, where you started, well, I guess, your job from Price Club, I guess, going over to Costco. It, it sounds like it, there's there's an element of being at the right place at the right time. How, how important is that to you know, be in a company that would give you an opportunity to be able to develop and get those skills? Or if I pick a company that really doesn't have that kind of future, I mean, do, do, could, could I still you know, 
succeed like you have? I would say absolutely. You can you can you can be successful regardless of where you're at. Um, and I would say that <coughs> if you if you're currently with a, a company that you're not doing what you're passionate about, then I would say start to look where there's opportunities for that. Because um, you could be be someplace and and it's fitting that need, right? It allows you to pay the bills. It allows you to feed your family. And it allows you to have whatever creative outlet that you're interested in. Like when, once you have kind of your, I'll just speak for myself. Once I have my basic needs met, then I'm looking at, um, you know, what can I do that is the interest. And from interest for me is, am I delivering value in what I'm doing? Because I don't want to do something just to do it. I want to do it because it's personally rewarding, and it is providing value to the company that I'm working with. And then. It may get to a place where, okay, I don't see where I can grow any further here. And that's when you have to make all these decisions of, do I stay where I'm at because it pays the bills and I'll just do that till I retire? Or do I have an opportunity to go do something else where I can continue on that growth path? And so for me coming over to Coal Fire, it's an extension. Um, I never would have seen it, like I mentioned, I never would have seen myself in that spot way back when, but all of that experience, all of the education, all the continual learning, because I, I was a programmer for a time, then I, I left Costco one other time and went to a, a smaller company that wrote the first native web server for the i-series, for the AS400. And that's where I learned HTML and JavaScript. I had to learn WML for the wireless market language. I had to learn WML over the weekend for a sales presentation on Monday. <laughs> so like on a Thursday, I'm, I'm told, okay, you need to make this application work for a, a cell phone, right? The display's only like this big. Oh, go to WAP, uh, you know, WAP dot whatever. You know, you get a little phone simulator. So I was testing my code there. But that's like on a Thursday, I was told by Monday they want to do this presentation to a large company on the East Coast. So because I have continued to learn, and I love it, but you know, being able to problem solve, and I think that that's kind of tying into what Tom was talking about, it got me thinking and reminded me of being able to problem solve. Whether you're working in accounting, whether you're working in IT, whether you're doing some other thing, if you can solve business problems, then you're going to have greater opportunities especially if your boss or people around you know that. I used to be very quiet. I used to think that, okay, I'll just be really good and I'll just do my thing and I won't do much damage there, right? Well, then you watch these people around you get promoted and you're like going, wait a minute, wait a minute. So not being self-promoting per se, but just realizing that there is an element to, you know, people knowing about you without being you know, a, a bragger about it. Right? Being confident is probably the best thing you can do overall, is be good at what you do. And if you're doing something you don't like, maybe look at if you can doing something else. But following after something you're passionate about, if you find that niche, and just you know go at it with, with everything you have. And yes, it is very important or being in the right place at the right time, or, you know, I never thought a couple of years ago on a com that I'd actually be working with them at the same place, because I was I was quite happy doing what I was doing over, you know, at the retailer, so. You know, I would have been happy to come over three years ago, because we were a different company then, too, right? So I think a lot, a lot of that is, like you said, it is it is being persistent. The, the, the other thing I really thought about is, you know, it was one of the, so, in addition to IT and my MBA, I actually took a couple classes. I actually wanted to be a religious education teacher. I actually took a couple classes in ethics and uh, the Old Testament down at the University of San Diego. And one of the things I really liked about that is one of the ones I took about is really talked about kind of who you are and what you do. One of the things that stuck out to me is you know, when you have one the next, you're going to see Super Bowl quarterbacks play this, this time. And there's obviously an element of blocking what they do and being right next to the white time. But they didn't get there. You know, very rarely does someone just luck out for no reason at all. Maybe, you know, winning the lottery is probably going to be the, the one thing. But when you look at it and you do it, usually you, you, you 
you've done and you built yourself so you have those opportunities to get there. And one of the things that someone asked me about, you know, while I thought I was doing a pretty good job, and I said, Tom, what are the things that you do every day and every week? Right? You eat every day. You go to the bathroom every day. You take a shower every day. Those are things that you do. That that defines who you are and what your character is. And so if you say, yeah, it's great, you know, I give back, you say, well, how often do you give back? Do you do that every day? Do you send an email out every day? Spend your time every day doing something every day, every week. If you do that every day, every week, it becomes who you are and it increases the chances that you're going to look out and connect with someone. If you just wait for those opportunities to pop up, then, then you're never going to have them. And so, like, for example, there's some basic things that I do every day that I do spend at least half an hour of every day helping someone out for no reason. You're just a customer that wants to know about something or, you know, it's just going to you both the same. Ask me if I know about some technology or something, but I'll go and I'll look at it. So I spend half an hour every day helping someone out. And you know, I usually end up helping out. You know, I also then will also send at least three emails every day to existing customers, employees, past people that I've worked with. So I do that every day, uh, and those are kind of little habits that I start my day off. It's just amazing. Today, my day is filled from all the little reach outs that I did yesterday and the day before. Um, and so those little things just kind of allow you to keep going. And it's easy to. I mean, I can tell you it's easy. I've got four-month-old twins. I've got a two-year-old. I work about 70 hours a week. I travel 30,000 miles in January. Uh, it's easy for me to say that I don't have time to do those things, but I ingrain it into my character, and I make sure that I find the time to do that every day without exception. Which is one of the things that I most probably learned how to play football growing up. It's all the fundamentals that you do kind of all, 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 all the time. How are we doing on time? I think uh, his pizza's, pizza's here. Pizza's here. So I think we'll uh, break at this point and can continue the conversation individually with uh, folks here. And, and as a reminder, Wednesday from 11 to 1, we've got the next generation IT club. So, a great way to help out. It's good. Network.